Welcome to another episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader to discuss the latest cybersecurity trends and how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, as well as tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Bradley Gross has an interesting career arc. He's the founder and president of the law office of Bradley Gross, PA, but he started his career as a hacker. As a professional steeped in the ways of cybersecurity hacking and all the attendant ethical and legal baggage surrounding it, uh, Brad now structures his law practice around these areas, providing IT and technology consulting, trademark and copyright res- registration and enforcement, online privacy and security, restrictive covenants for the development and use of IP, and more. Uh, we're going to talk today about his career journey and learn something about these uh, this underserved area in uh, cybersecurity law. Bradley Gross is the founding partner of the law office of Bradley Gross, PA, a boutique law firm that focuses on transactions involving MSPs, VARs, and tech companies worldwide. His firm represents more MSPs than all other US-based law firms, and he is an international legal authority in the area of cloud computing transactions. He's been named on nine occasions to the list of super lawyers in the area of IT and technology laws, and speaks at industry events throughout the world on issues involving data privacy and security. Brad, thank you so much for taking time today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so tell me about your unconventional career journey. What, what, first of all, what, what type of hacker were you and uh, when and where did you first get interested in hacking and computers in general? So I was the best kind of hacker. I was yeah. 10 years old, <laughs> I was turning 50, so you can do the math. Yep. I was young, fearless, and I was doing things back in the day, you know, about 40 years ago mm-hmm. when um, the law in the area was in its infancy and companies really didn't have their defenses up. People weren't thinking about those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it made it fairly easy for my friends and I, who, who were young computer nerds, the first generation of computer nerds, yeah. uh, uh, to start hacking into things, whether it was software, BBSs, uh, uh, phone freaking. Mm. It's a fairly open and wide territory because no one really had their eye on what was going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, uh, what were, do you have any sort of hacking war stories or frightening or amazing attacks or accomplishments from those times? Well, it's interesting. You know, back in that day, uh, we were using, I was using my first computer, a TRS-80 Model 1 Level 2. Wow, you were hacking with a TRS-80. Yeah, I have some street cred. See, I, I can swing the lingo. In fact, I yeah. still have that computer in my right. office, and it still works. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the only thing I had to replace on it was the power supply, and I got that on eBay, believe there it or go. not. Yeah. So it, it works. Um, but back in the day, you know, my friends and I, would we'd hack into BBSs, right, which were the precursors of websites. Yep. And I had a, a, I had a 300 baud modem. I remember when my buddy got a 1200 baud modem, and we were all jealous because that was – you know, that was magical that was, to us back yeah, lightning then. Speed. Oh, it was lightning. It was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I had the kind that you had to dial the phone. You actually had to dial the phone the, and then take it, put the put it in the curse, in the, in the cradle, right, in the cradle. And, um, you know, we did a, a fair amount of, you know, uh, brute force hacking, password guessing, and, and to no real avail. I mean, we got into these BBSs and you'd say, now what? I don't know. Now we'll post <laughs> crazy things. Uh, what are you going to do? You're 10, you're 11. What do you know? Um, we did a fair amount of phone freaking. Okay. I remember we bought uh, the supplies at Radio Shack uh, and, and, and built a phone freak box that we would go to a pay phone. We'd hold the box up to the, uh, to the receiver, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the, uh, you know, the voice part, right. and, and it would emulate the sounds of quarters and dimes being dropped into the phone. Right. So the phone would think you just put in $10 worth of quarters. It would let you call whatever you want, whoever you want to call. Mm-hmm. I was 11. Who am I going to call? I didn't know who to call. I lived yeah, on Long right. Island. I, I my, friends a, were, my friends were within a five-block radius. Yeah, you just wanted <laughs> was, the accomplishment of doing it. Yeah, we had the accomplishment. So we would just, uh, you know, uh, 212 and then random numbers. And we're thinking, wow, we're calling Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a major thing. But for us, at the age of 11 or 12, it was really just creating the box and realizing that, you can take technology, turn it on its head, and then have fun with it, really. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that was where it all started for me. 
So this is all probably pre the movie War Games then even? Did you guys ever have the in inclination of hacking into something larger, say a government? Project? We had the inclination, but we didn't have the guts. Okay. Uh, we okay. definitely tried to hack into some, if I remember now, we're going back 35 years ago. I know we hacked into some municipalities, mm. some utilities, uh, just by password guessing. It wasn't very complicated. Um, but, you know, once you're in there, immediately the... Uh, you know, the, the thought of oh, someone's going to catch us. So, you know, but it wasn't the authorities catching us. Yeah. It was more of my dad's going to catch me, right? <laughs> my mom, your sister's going to walk in, tell you, you know, your mom, and then what? So those um, are the people in your world who are going to punish you. <laughs> absolutely. That's, yeah. That was our small world. Now, right. you know, had we continued along those lines for a number of years, it probably would have advanced into something more advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but it was largely limited to hacking into BBSs, easy to guess municipalities, a lot of copying of software, breaking through the code, the bits, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, data protection that they would have on there and phone freaking. That's where I started out. Did you sort of continue, you know, maybe in a, in a less, you know, uh, malignant way, sort of understanding this as, as you went on and as the technology improved? Uh, I would like to take the fifth amendment on that. No, I'm joking. No, I'll tell you, as you know, as I got older, uh, it, it, it developed more into a coding, uh, uh, more of a coding interest than an actual hacking interest. Because again, I don't think I had the, uh, the hard wiring to really do anything nefarious. So if you're not right. doing anything nefarious after a while, it's, you know, you sit back and you think, okay, I did that. I, you know, I hacked in here. I got the password for that. Yeah. Now what am I going to do? Nothing. Let me yeah. move on to something a little more productive. To accomplish the things you wanted to accomplish. Yeah. Um, so, okay, was there a defining moment that made you realize that you wanted to be on the legal side of cybersecurity or did you become delusioned over, you know, del disillusioned over time or yeah. was it as simple as just needing a change of pace? Most definitely. So I started out in the DA's office in Nassau County, New York. Okay. I started out like every other prosecutor in traffic court, misdemeanors, felonies, and so forth. But one day... And this was sort of the light bulb moment. Everyone has a light bulb moment that goes, you know, over their head. Ding! Oh, I could do this. Um, one day, the bureau chief was walking up and down the, the hallway, cursing at the top of his lungs because he was the bureau chief. He could do that. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do with this thing. Why did they arrest this guy? What's going on? And everyone's wondering, what's, you know, what's, what's doing? What's going on? The bureau chief walks right, right by my office and our eyes lock. Just have to look mine probably because I was scared about what he was yelling. Um, our eyes lock, and he looks at me and he says, "You, gross. You know about computers, right?" I said, "Yeah." And he dropped his big file on my desk. He said, "This is yours. Handle it." It turned out to be the first case of computer stalking and or harassment in the U.S. This is back wow. in like 1994, 95. Okay. Uh, back then, what happened was a woman broke up with her boyfriend. And he then proceeded to post all of her personal information, as well as some not so flattering commentary about her uh, on dozens of BBSs everywhere. Everywhere she went, it was for a good time call. And it was her real name, her real phone number, her real address. So she calls the cops and the cops see what's going on. They have no idea. What, they have no idea what to do. Right. This is 20 plus years, 25 years ago, they had no idea. Uh, they interview the guy and he admits to it. It's like, yeah, I posted it. So now what? All right. And the cops were, yeah, now what? <laughs> now what? So what they did was they arrested him for harassment. They couldn't think of anything else. They arrested him. Today, if you do the same crime in New York or Florida where I'm sitting, uh, it's a felony. You could be charged with a felony. You go to jail, prison, actually. Yeah. Uh, back then, it was just harassment. We took it to trial. Uh, he was found guilty at a bench trial. Mm -hmm. uh, he got a $50 fine, like a parking ticket, walked out the door. It wasn't even a crime. It was like a parking ticket. No, slap on the wrist. Like I said, yeah, today it would be a felony. Back then, he walked out the door. But again, it's sort of like what we were talking about with the phone freaking and the hacking. It wasn't so much that I did it. It was that it, was that, um, it could be done. Mm -hmm. It was that we could actually pursue people who engage in that type of activity. And so the light bulb went off and I thought, wow, I can merge what I know about computers and technology and, and programming with what I'm doing, the law, and I can do this. Yeah. And that led to a career for a while in the DA's office up there going after computer 
crimes and starting the Internet and Computer Crime Division of the State Attorney's Office in Miami-Dade, uh, Florida, in Miami-Dade County. Okay, well, tell me a little more about that. Did you, you know, so there must have been kind of a, a mixed or a bittersweet feeling of, well, we got the guy, but we got him on this, you know, on a pretty low charge. Were, were you able to sort of craft your case against people like this to sort of increase the penalties or increase time or yeah. just make it known as more of a, more of a, an important legal issue than it was at the time? Well, so at that time, you know, the law really hadn't caught up with the technology. I mean, we were far behind. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, largely, if you were going to really enforce a criminal act involving technology, it was usually against the child predators, the online sure. predators, yeah. right, that would go onto BBSs. Eventually, they became chat rooms, right, yeah. with CompuServe. AOL, yeah. For mm -hmm. those of you who remember that, AOL. Sure. And, um and they would try to solicit 10-year-olds who they thought were 10 or 11-year-olds, right, mm -hmm. into sex acts and so forth. Uh, we would have detectives, of course, posing as these kids. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know that, you know, while they think they're talking to an 11-year-old boy, they're talking to, you know, Charlie the cop, who's 300 right. pounds with a full beard mm -hmm. and pipes with two very big fingers like this, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and that was very rewarding to go and, and pursue these guys, right? And, and, yeah. and arrange for meetings and then see them arrested and put them in jail. So the technology and, and, and the criminal laws, at least back then, were sort of kind of on par, sort of kind of. It wasn't until later, actually, after I was no longer a prosecutor, when things started to amp up. And in fact, I sat on a, um, on a, a, a commission with Governor, then Governor Jeb Bush in Florida, mm -hmm. to determine how we could increase penalties and enhance the law to accommodate not only these new technology crimes, but how to enforce uh, civilly uh, technology and privacy, and uh, uh, as well as encourage uh, more business from a techno technological perspective in Florida. But that really came about starting in about 2000 forward. Before that, it was, uh, it was what you could make of it. Yeah, kind of the Wild West. Right. Um, so, okay, so jumping ahead to that, when, when did you start the office of Bradley Gross? We mentioned in the intro, but so tell me sure. about your mission statement and the types of cases you take on, especially. Sure, uh, sure, sure. So I started the, um, I started my office back in 2011, back mm -hmm. in October, 2011. I had been a, um, I had been a, a, a director and a partner in a very large law firm here in Florida, uh, handling intellectual property and corporate and the technology end of things. And so, you know, eventually you think, well, okay, we could, I could, I could do it better on my own. So I formed my own firm. Uh, my mission really in my firm is to merge uh, technology, my knowledge of technology at a grassroots level uh, with plain speak, jargon free. OK, mm -hmm. uh, to empower clients to make the best decisions they can make. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they can engage in deals and transactions in which they make a lot of money and they get a lot of a lot of benefit from. Uh, it is a fairly interesting and unique firm in that way because we understand technology. I'm a, I'm a computer hacker that went to law school. I'm not a lawyer that understands technology. Yes. So, you know, along those lines, we represent a huge range of companies uh, globally, from, from white hat hackers uh, to pen testing companies to uh, uh, security monitoring services, companies that offer phishing solutions. Because, you know, when we sit in a room with them, we understand the technology, the good, bad, and ugly, and we could get down to business. Okay. And that's a great firm to work with. In fact, you know, my staff, they could come in in t shirts and jeans as long as they're comfortable, happy, and doing what they're doing. It's all good. Okay, so what are some what are some of the the common services that you provide to these types of tech organizations? So we largely represent them in transactions. Uh, we okay. do some litigation in federal court and and a little bit in state court, but we try to stay out of court. You know, I always say, mm -hmm. you you know, you you grow old, you stop fighting, right? You stop mm -hmm. fighting. I've learned that if you're fighting in court, then something not only has gone wrong, but the only people who are making money are the attorneys, right? Uh, and that doesn't benefit anyone but the attorneys. So what we try to do is engage in transactions and make those transactions as jargon-free, as straightforward, and as beneficial as possible. 
All right. So that might be uh, licensing, structuring licensing deals. It might be uh, uh, structuring intellectual property transactions in which companies who have technology want to monetize it. We might represent companies that need the technology and are acquiring it. Yep. Uh, we might represent digital, uh, uh, digital companies that, as we discussed earlier, um, are specialists in cybersecurity. They're the ones that you call in to test your systems, right? To try mm -hmm. to hack in, to give security awareness training, to provide you with policies, monitoring, remediation, and so forth. Um, we represent well over a thousand of those types of companies globally. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's a good part of the law. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously you, you mentioned it that, you know, that you're a, a former hacker who's a lawyer rather than a lawyer who learned a little bit about tech, but what are some of the specific skills that you learned as a hacker, be it problem solving or whatever that helped you most in your work as a lawyer? Sure. Sure. I'll tell you, there are two skill sets that every hacker has. And once you learn them, they are a life's lesson. All right. And the skills are patience and confidence, patience and confidence. It, it, it is crucial. Any good hacker, right, has the patience to keep trying. And if something doesn't work, try it in a different way. And if something doesn't work, try it in a different way. And that's not to say you don't get frustrated. You get frustrated, yeah. but you're patient enough to understand that the frustration is situational, right? It's situational. Mm -hmm. Stay with it. And eventually that will go away. And that leads into the other, you know, uh, the other thing, which is confidence. You have to know that there is a hole, there's a way, there's something there and you'll get to it. If you have enough patience, right. And you don't give up and you, and you don't allow your frustration to overtake your patience. Well, then you can remain confident. You stay with it. And, uh, you know, whether it's brute force hacking or password guessing or social engineering, whatever it is, or even in life, right? With yeah. lawyers or doctors or any, any service, mm -hmm. you stay patient. If it doesn't work, you try it a different way. If it doesn't work, a third way. If that doesn't work, I think there's a fourth way. There's got to be a fourth way, yeah. right? There's always a fourth if way. you stay confident that you know what you're doing and you understand your skill set, you're going to get the goal. You're going to get to where you want to be. Every hacker learns that at an early age. I learned it, and it's really, really helped me in my career, most definitely. So obviously, you've had such a fascinating career and, and so much, and I'd be dropping the ball if I didn't ask you for some war stories. Are there any particularly unusual cybersecurity-related cases you ever litigated and, and some surprising things that you've seen happen inside a courtroom? Well, you know, from a, from a courtroom perspective, we would go back to, to the criminal end of things, right? Sure. Going after these, these child predators, there right. was nothing more rewarding still to this day. There was nothing more rewarding uh, that I've done than, than putting these people in, in, in prison. And then, of course, you know, the, the, the interesting part is hearing why they did what they were going to do. Oh, we were entrapped. Or, oh, I thought it was a joke. Oh, I didn't mean it. Right? You didn't mean it. Sure, sure. You came to the mall with rope. Literally rope. Mm -hmm. I mean, all kinds of things to yeah. meet a, a, an underage kid. So that was a wonderful experience putting them in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, from a, a litigation perspective, you know, where, where we find a lot of the interesting stuff occurring is in representing security companies that when they're doing what they're supposed to do, right, pen testing, uh, really, you know, pushing the limits of, of, a, of a client's defenses and so forth, um, defending them when the inevitable happens, right? They do penetrate the defenses. Bad thing, you know, here's, here's a great story. So we represented a, uh, a white hat hacking company. And I tell this, this uh, story whenever I speak. It, we represent this white hat hacking company and they were hired to break into a bank. The bank hired them in, in a state, I won't mention the state, in a state, and they had about 14 branches in the state. So they were hired to, to break in, and they did. Well, they, or at least they tried to. And what happened was the bank's security system detected the, the, the attempt and shut down the attempt. Now, it did that by shutting down every computer, every server in the bank in the middle of the week oh my gosh. in all 14 branches. Wow. And because of the way it was set up, the security would not allow the computers to come back online for at least 24 hours. So here you had the bank saying, what did you do? You know, what did you, you shut us down in the middle of the week. Yeah. Of course, we were operating under an agreement that we had drafted that said, look, 
We're walking in, essentially, we're walking into a dark room. We may cut across that room and not bump into something. We may bump into something. Some things may get knocked down. There is no standard way of breaking into a bank. We're going to try some orthodox methods, some unorthodox methods. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen. So you understand, right, that there are known knowns and there are known unknowns, and we're going to be held harmless from that. So despite the bank's calls and threats and, you know, demand letters and so forth, once they really took a look at the contract, you know, they understood, well, that's the nature of pen testing. And that's sort of a lesson for those companies that are engaged in that security paradigm, those security yeah. services. They need to know there are known knowns, there are known unknowns. And while they understand that, they need their clients to understand that right? You need yeah. your client to thoroughly understand that. That's how you manage expectations. That's how you stay out of court. Yeah. Have you done a lot of that sort of, I mean, it sounds like you were drifting in almost to, to red teaming territory where you're sort of, you know, broaching the perimeter on, you know, on site and things like that. Have you done a lot of that sort of controlled penetration testing for, for security companies and so forth? Have I done it? Or well, my clients do that. Your right? clients do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't do any pen testing. Yeah, I'm not sure, that sure. good. Okay. I can, right, right. I can design a website now. Okay. <laughs> I can do All some right. coding. Right. right, right. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not breaking into any banks anytime soon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're, okay. So you're, you're the, the legal mitigator that's, that's, that's letting right. everyone understand that this is what's going on. I, I'm the Rosetta Stone. Okay. Yeah. I'm the guy who my client will talk in some sort of technical jargon yep. and then I have to explain it to opposing counsel that yeah. barely knows he's happy he just turned on his laptop and it worked right he's happy he knew how to upgrade right. uh, from okay. Windows 10 to whatever he's using sure. so I'm sort of the Rosetta Stone I translate it and, and bring the situation to a, a decent level and try to resolve issues. That's yeah, what we do. I, this this dates me as well, but I, I always people like that. I always have the image of the uh, the old cartoons of like the octopus, who's the the phone operator that's doing all the different you know connecting that's points it. and so forth. That's it. And you um, have to know where all the phones are located and where you're putting them. But, yeah, yes. every everyone. Um, so in your intro, you mentioned that you are uh, an international legal authority in the area of cloud computing transactions. What is yes. what does that mean exactly? How did you become that specific type of expert? What was the what was the draw? So what we do is we represent multinational companies, companies that are located here in the EU, uh, in South America. Uh, uh, you know, they are in this global economy. I know it's a cliche to say that, but it's truth. It's the truth. In this global economy, it is very rare to have a substantial sized company located only in the United States or only in uh, the United States and maybe Canada near shore. Usually they're located in London, in Switzerland, in Barcelona, and so forth. So what you need to do is you need to understand both the regulatory compliance needs of all those different locations, right? And if you don't understand them, you need to know where you find people who do. And so that's largely what we'll often do. You know, we'll be called into a, a place in France, uh, and they'll say, well, you know, we have a place in New York, and in Miami, and in Paris. Well, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. I don't know Parisian laws, but I do know someone who does. Right. And so sometimes I'm a traffic cop, right? I'm sort of directing issues to different people. And when you do that, you become known as the guy who can handle international transactions. So while we can handle matters that are uh, entirely local, may be bound to a single state. Uh, we are not intimidated and we handle it all the time when a company comes to us and says, look, we have companies in, all over the US, Canada, and Europe. Here are the issues, right? It's all cloud-based, this, that. We're storing some of the stuff in Ireland. We're going to co-locate in, in uh, you know, Idaho in a bunker. And then, uh, you know, how are we going to handle this? That's what we do. So just doing it time and time again and understanding the technology at a grassroots level, allows us really to step up and become experts in the field. Uh, so uh, the, our particular podcast is speaking, spoken a lot this year about the skills gap in cybersecurity, yeah. uh, you know, a short version that, you know, there's, there's more cyber positions out there than there are qualified people to fill them. Do you feel that there's a similar issue in security law? Are there enough security focused lawyers out there? Or is this a career path that's kind of understaffed at the moment? Well, thank God there aren't um, that many security focused lawyers out there. Uh, it sort of leaves a large, large area of real estate for, yeah. for us to, uh, to, to explore. Uh, but if we're, you know, just speaking candidly and, and, and genuinely, no, there are very, very few lawyers, very few. 
Mm -hmm. I could count in, in the state of Florida, I could count on one hand the number of attorneys that I would consider qualified to engage in that type of thing. Um, and I think that it's largely because it's an intimidating area, right? It's not yeah. something that you learn in law school. It's right. not something that you're going to learn working for a large firm or the government. It's something that you almost need to incorporate from your personal life, yeah. like I did. Yeah, it's like double majoring, but you're double careering. You're basically right. learning a full career and then a second full career. That's it. You know, if you're a computer guy and then or, or woman, mm -hmm. uh, and you say, okay, I'm going to go to law school and I'm going to merge the two, well, that's wonderful. But there aren't a lot of computer people out there that want to go to law school. They stay right. computer people or they are lawyers and they stay lawyers. They don't merge. And right. as a result, you have a lot of lawyers engaged in regulatory compliance and privacy and data uh, security uh, paradigms that really shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. They don't understand it and they treat it like anything else. Getting it with a hammer. It yeah. shouldn't be treated like anything else. Right? It's a unique thing. You don't dabble in this. Either you do it or you do not do it. And so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there aren't enough lawyers in this field and I'm not complaining about that right now. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, in your opinion, what are some of the biggest legal issues currently looming over the cybersecurity horizon that aren't being addressed? Well, I'll tell you, I think that um, right now, the, the biggest problem that people are facing is ignorance. That's it. It's ignorance. They don't, um, they don't understand what dangers exist, right? So that's the first part. They don't understand uh, the threat. They are ignorant of compliance requirements. They are ignorant of the results of non-compliance. Mm -hmm. And it is that ignorance that is pushing most of the agenda today. Uh, and they don't take things, you know, companies, individuals, companies, they don't take things seriously until something bad really happens. Mm -hmm. And then when it happens, well, it might be too late. The liabilities are immense. And that that's how cyber criminals, uh, that's, that's what they do. That's how they do so well, right? Yeah. They leverage that ignorance. And you could read all about this in, in the newspaper and watch it on the news. Oh, Equifax had a breach, this, that, and so on. You know, of course, everyone reads that, okay, and thinks, wow, that's crazy. We should be doing something better, right? We should be really, we should be on top of that. And then, and then they will all download an app right? They'll download an app that makes them look older, right? Yeah, you know, they'll, right. they'll upload their pictures so it makes them look older and they say, hey, look, I look, yeah. I'm 20 years older, not realizing that now they're sending their, their email address, their identity, so some address in the middle yeah. of nowhere. You don't even know where that's going. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, people on, they look on the one hand and then they say, oh my God, we got to do something about security and privacy. On the other hand, then they go home and do crazy things. Yep. So, it's that ignorance that is pushing the agenda and needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, in, in the hot take department, what, what's your take on the, uh, there, there was a story in Lake City, Florida about an IT employee uh, who was fired after the city was forced to approve a half million dollar payment to cover a ransom payment. It, yeah. was, it, was, it was believed that he sort of fell asleep on the job or, you know, something got through on his watch. Uh, do you feel this was justified or do you think that the city kind of put the blame for a systemic issue on a scapegoat? So I'm familiar with that case only to the extent that I've read it in the newspaper and online like everyone else. So it's hard to say, but not being familiar with all the facts, but I, I, and, and, and realizing also that companies all over the world are having the exact same oh, yeah. problem, right? Oh, so yeah. it's not like Lake City could turn around and say, how dare you do this? Or how could this happen to us? It's, it's happened to everybody, right? Oh, all right. But that said, I think it comes down to certain questions that need to be answered. And as far as I know, they haven't been at least in the news. Okay. I mean, for example, what, what security paradigms were in place, right, at that time? And were they recommended to the city by the IT director and not implemented? Or did the IT director simply proceed in ignorance, you know, not realizing that there are bigger and better ways to do things? There are processes that need to be in place. Um, did he, you know, fail to implement any sort of, the, any sort of initiatives? Um, were there procedures in place for backup and recovery? If not, why, right? Mm -hmm. Was there an incident response plan in place that could help mitigate the problems? If not, why, right? You, you can't, what you often find in municipalities and in large companies, all right, is that they spread responsibility so thin that no one takes responsibility, yes. okay? And so 
when something like this happens and they point the finger at you know a person it's very easy to say well it wasn't just me there are three other people who i told and they didn't respond and then it dropped off the agenda and you know that doesn't mean that someone shouldn't take responsibility I, yeah i'd love to know did they have a computer emergency response to a cert team right that could have mitigated these issues if not why not um and i'll tell you this anyone including lake city who doesn't have those processes and procedures in place, having gone through this and having read about it now, shame on them. Shame on them because yeah. this is going to not, it might, you didn't hear me say it might, this is going to happen to them. Uh, and when it does, rest assured, people will try to spread responsibility thin. And then it's going to be a question of well, whose fault was it? And so on. It shouldn't be that way. Yeah. Everyone should have defined responsibility risk should be allocated amongst a group of people that are named with definitive positions and responsibilities right with backup plans mm -hmm. and procedures in place there shouldn't be it shouldn't be a fire drill um you know uh, running around you know wondering where the exits are when something like this happens instead it should be okay open up your handbook page 65 here's what we're going to do one two three four that's what it should be. Now, were those processes in place in Lake City? I don't know. If they weren't, then whoever should have had them in place or whoever's job it was to make sure they were in place, yeah, he or she should have been fired. Right. And that's my opinion. And, you know, and there's, a, there's plenty of situations where all those things can be in place and something still gets through. But yeah, you're right that they're, you Agreed. know, everyone's well, going to get hit eventually. But, you know. Yeah. I mean, if people are acting responsibly, uh, responsibly and pursuant to a plan, you're 100% right. Things can still happen. Yep. But at that point, you could say we acted with not just a standard, a, a good standard of care. We acted up here. You know, we're yeah, way yeah. up. And at that point, no one should lose their job. It's, it's, right. a, it's, it's, but it's when people just ignore things, right? Yes. They assume things are in place. You're not paid to assume. You're not paid to ignore. OK, if, if we wanted someone to ignore, we could fire you and just put the, you know, a kid in there. We could hire, a, you know, somebody at 12 bucks an hour to just sit there on the table. Yeah. Right. So you're not paid to ignore. So if you ignore, it's on you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it seems like a good deal of your work uh, deals with intellectual property in the tech and security realms. Uh, what, what are the big issues in the area of IP at the moment? What are some things that security practitioners and enterprises don't do properly to protect their IP? A lot right now is just theft of IP, right? Theft of creative works, yep. theft of marketing plans, theft of customer lists. Those are prime targets. Uh, personal information right now is obviously very, very big. Uh, you know, the collection of it and the and the storage and the access to it are are, are really uh, activities that companies are engaged in, and they are sort of ignorant of the threats. And so that kind of intangible property is really the prime target um, and companies that don't understand the risk and don't have certs in place and, and policies and procedures, well, they're going to get hit. Uh, you know, phishing attacks, for example, they're ubiquitous. Yep. They're everywhere. And yet very few companies actually engage security firms to test their employees, yep. to provide security awareness and so on. So, you know, what's the big thing that that's out there? All kinds of intangible information. Uh, what are they not doing? They're not teaching. They're not engaged. Yeah. Um, and, and as a result, they're all sitting ducks. They're sitting ducks. They're slow moving targets for these hackers. And they will eventually implement these plans. They'll implement the, them, however, after things go bad. After the barns burn. That's not how it should be done. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, tell me a little about your own podcast. You, you do a, you have a podcast called the Technology Broadcast. Uh, what is what's what's the focus, and uh, what have you what what's your what's been your favorite episode to record so far? Hmm. So, the Technology Broadcast is um, is 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 my brainchild. That uh, you know, I sat back and I thought there's a lot of stuff I just want to convey to clients and to people in the technology field, and it's just not. You know, I speak a lot, I write a lot, but it's just not out there in, 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 a, in a spoken way, right? I think that I can convey ideas pretty well when I just sit down with people and talk to them. Yeah. And there's no better venue to do that than through a podcast. So the podcast really focus on, focuses on uh, managed service providers, VARs, OEMs, and the issues that they're going to face on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. And, and that might be things related to 
how a particular law uh, 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 will influence or impact what they do. It might relate to their customer facing agreements or their lack thereof, right? right? The lack of agreements uh, and what risks they have. I like to think of it this way. <clears throat> I like to think of it as if you're, a, if you're an MSP or you're a solution provider, think of all the things that keep you up at night, right? Think of those things. The clients that don't pay you, the clients that challenge everything you do, the clients that don't listen to your advice, right? Yep. Now, what do you do about that? What do you do about that? Most people would sit there and say, I'm not sure, right? You're not sure. I know you're not sure because you're like everyone else. They're not sure either. But you know who's sure? I'm sure. I know what you do. So that's why I have a podcast. I talk about what needs to be in agreements, what needs to be in statements of work, what do you need to do to get things off the ground, limit your liability so you can sleep at night. And I don't know of any other podcast that's out there. I had to give it a little funky name instead of just technology podcast because that would make people you know, go to sleep. So I call it the Bradcast. Very clever. I know. Very clever. But but it worked. You heard it here first. Brad has the answer. That's right. I have the answer. <laughs> Here's your slogan. So uh, is this is this uh, available at all the sort of podcatchers of choice? And I, yeah, it's funny. You say that. I have the answer. My answer, my motto is always, you're going to learn a lot. That's okay. my motto. You're going to learn a lot. That's what all it's right. about. Uh, I know it's available. Uh, 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 well, if you Google it, it's available. It's on the Play Store. It's okay. on Podbean. And it's about to be on iTunes as well. Good. Okay. Yeah. And it's, uh, if you go to technologybradcast.com, you'll find it. Great. Okay. Uh, so as we wrap up today, what, what piece of free legal advice would you like to give to the cybersecurity industry as a whole or to the people who work in it? Wow. Wow. That's a good one. So I guess the one bit of advice um, would be vigilance, right? Uh, the way I look at it is um, imagine for a moment you're walking down a street, right? A dark street and, and you think you're being followed, right? So what do you do? You turn around, right? You turn around and say, what's going on, right? You turn around. And it, let's say you see nothing. Do you just keep walking and that's it? You just say, oh, there was nothing there. I'm fine. Of course not. Every now and then you still turn around, right? You still look because what wasn't there at one point might be there at a different point, right? What you didn't see at that moment in time when you turn a different way or a few steps later, you have a different vantage point, right? A different perspective. And you might see things you didn't see then, right? So it always amazes me when I see companies that will do a pen test, right? Or some sort of security awareness training, or they'll have their agreements maybe reviewed once on day one, and then years will go by and they won't think about it. Really? You're not going to turn around again? Really? I mean, you really think you're going to make it down that dark street and no one's behind you and things haven't changed and your perspective is the same? It isn't. So I guess my, my bit of advice is be vigilant, question things, right? Be patient and confident, but don't be so confident, right, to have a false sense of security. There are a lot of bad people out there. Perspectives change. Circumstances change. Stay on top of it. Be vigilant. Don't just turn around once turn around often. And I think that you'll find yourself way ahead of the pack. All right. And so we've, we've, we've promoted the Bradcast, but uh, if people want to get in touch with Brad Gross or the law firm of Bradley Gross PA, uh, where, where should they go online? They could either contact us by phone, 954-217-6225, uh, or they could drop an email at info at bradleygross.com or visit the website right? BradleyGross.com. There's a, a contact page there. Subscribe to the podcast. We'd love to have you. If you have questions, you call or email us. And um, really, this is what I enjoy doing. Well, Brad, Brad Gross, thank you so much for being here. This was really fascinating. I, I would appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Okay. And thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you may find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in Cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search Cyberwork with InfoSec in your favorite podcast catcher. To see current promotional offers available for podcast listeners and to learn more about our InfoSec Pro Live Bootcamp, InfoSec Skills On Demand Training Library, and InfoSec IQ Security Awareness and Training Platform, go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast or click the link in the description below. Thanks once again to Bradley Gross and thank you all again as always for listening and watching. We'll speak to you next week.